The path of daggers begins with Queen Ethaniel of Candor. She and the other three Borderlander rulers are having a secret meeting because they're all disturbed and worried about everything that Randall Thor has been doing in the southern nations. So they decide to travel south with an army and confront the Dragon Reborn, even if it means risking their own lives. We then see Nynaeve, Elaine, and Avienda in Ebudar as they're getting ready to leave the city with the kin, the sea folk, and some Aes Sedai after finally retrieving the Bowl of the Winds. A new kind of shadow spawn called a golem is after them, so they're going to a farm to hide from it and to use the Bowl of the Winds to finally fix the weather. Avienda makes a gateway to leave Ebudar, and as they're going through it, Elaine checks to see how strong in the one power the sea folk are and she notices that one of them is just as strong as Nynaeve, which is impressive because Nynaeve is one of the most powerful channelers alive. After everyone goes through the gateway, Avienda starts to unweave the gateway because she thinks that she saw someone watching them and that person could possibly read the weave and follow them. When everyone notices what Avienda is doing, they all freak out because unweaving a weave is something that everyone considers impossible and very dangerous. But Avienda says that she learned it from the wise ones and that they told her that any woman can learn how to do it. But the Aes Sedai don't believe her. After a while, they finally reach the farm and they begin the process of using the Bowl of the Winds. The 13 most powerful channelers form a circle around the Bowl of the Winds and then they all link with one another. Finally, the channeler with full control of the circle channels into the Bowl of the Winds and the process of fixing the weather commences. Immediately after they're done, they sense a big amount of the One Power being used in Ebudar and then they spot a flying creature in the sky. Elaine and Avienda recognize the creature as a Rakan, which tells them that the Sunchan have returned. After they inform everyone about the Sunchan, they begin to get ready to leave and Elaine makes a gateway that leads to a village in Camelin. After everyone goes through the gateway, the Sunchan arrive with some Damani and Elaine decides to stay behind because she wants to unweave the gateway like Avienda did earlier so that the Sunchan are not able to read the weave and learn how to make gateways. As she unweaves the gateway, Avienda and Brigitta protect her but Elaine is not able to unweave it in time and a Domani manages to shield her. This makes the gateway weave explode and on one side of the gateway, the explosion kills a lot of the Sunchan and destroys the entire farm. And on the other side of the gateway, Elaine, Avienda and Brigitta get injured, but they manage to get back to the group and they are healed by Nynaeve. After some time, Elaine and the group finally reach Camelin and Elaine goes to the palace where she reveals her true identity. Elaine wants to claim the throne of Andor by herself because she believes that her mother is dead but she knows that convincing the noble houses to support her won't be easy. Meanwhile in the White Tower, things are not going well. The Ajas are more apart than ever before and Elida is being blackmailed by Alviarin who is a member of the Black Aja. Also, the group of Aes Sedai that Elida sent to the Black Tower got intercepted by a group of Ashaman that included the false dragon Loghain and they bonded the Aes Sedai. But even after all of the recent catastrophes, Elida still has hope that she will be triumphant at the end because she had a viewing where she saw the White Tower united once again. We switch over to Perrin and his army as they search for the dragon's prophet Masima in the country of Gildan. Rand sent Perrin on this mission because he knows that Masima has been using his name to gather a big amount of followers and now he wants them to join his forces. Perrin is trying to make contact with the Queen of Gildan and he decides to send Berylaine and the Aes Sedai to speak with the Queen. Suddenly, Perrin and his group spot some men attacking a group of people and Perrin goes to rescue them. These people turn out to be Morghese Trakand and her group and after Perrin rescues them, Morghese decides to keep her identity a secret so she introduces herself as Maegden, which was her mother's name. Morghese's group includes Basil Gill, who Perrin recognizes as the innkeeper of the Queen's Blessing, which is an inn he stayed at in Camelin in Book 1. 
Basil Gill informs Perrin that the Sun Chan attacked Amadisia and they took over the entire country. Fail then offers to take Morghese and her group into her service, and Morghese accepts. The next day, Elias Machera, who we hadn't seen since book 1, also joins Perrin. Elias is very surprised to see how far Perrin has come since they first met, and after he learns that Perrin married a Saldean, he tells Perrin that Saldean women like it when men raise their voice when speaking to them. At first, Perrin doesn't believe this to be true, but after a while, he realizes that Fael does like it when he shows more authority towards her. Perrin is then told that Berlain has returned from speaking to the Queen of Gildon, and when he goes to see her, he finds her with the Queen of Gildon herself. Her name is Aleandre, and after they speak for some time, Aleandre kneels in front of Perrin and she pledges fealty to him. Perrin doesn't accept her pledge of fealty at first because he thinks that she's just doing it because of his Tiberian effect, but after Aleandre tells him that she's doing it because she needs protection from the Prophet, Perrin accepts. Aleandre then informs Perrin where the Prophet currently is, and Perrin decides to take a small group of people with him to go see him. When Perrin sees Masima, he notices that he is insane. Masima has weird beliefs, and one of them is that the One Power should only be used by the Dragon Reborn, so when he sees Perrin with Aes Sedai, he gets angry. Perrin tells Masima that Rand sent him to take him and his followers to go see him. Masima agrees to go with him, but he refuses to travel using the One Power, so Perrin agrees to ride instead. Meanwhile, Fael, Berlin, and Morghese go out hunting with only a small group of guards. Fael finds out that Masima has been working with the Sanchan, and just as she's about to go tell Perrin, they are attacked by the Shido Aeo. Fael, Aleandre, and Morghese are taken by the Shido and they are made Gaishan. Berlin is the only person that manages to get away. Now we go over to Randall Thor who is currently in Ilion, dealing with what is left of Samael's army. They don't believe that Rand is the Dragon Reborn, so Rand gives them the option to either walk away unharmed or join his army. Afterwards, Rand returns to his camp and he finds a messenger from Mazrim Taim. The messenger updates Rand on the state of the Black Tower and he tells Rand that some of the male channelers have gone insane because of the taint in Sidene. He also informs Rand that the rebel Aes Sedai are currently on their way to the White Tower and that Mazrun Taim is worried because they might attack the Black Tower, but Rand orders the messenger to tell Taim not to worry and to leave the Aes Sedai alone. They're then interrupted by an Ashaman that tells Rand that the Sun Chan are getting ready to invade Ilion. Rand already knew that the Sun Chan had returned and that they took over the countries of Terabon and Medicia and most recently the city of Ebudar. Rand immediately begins to make plans on how to deal with the Sun Chan and he sends an Ashaman named Narishma on a secret mission. Rand starts to gather his forces in Ilion and he begins to get ready to take the Sun Chan by surprise and push them west. Narishma returns from his mission and he gives Rand an item that he says almost killed him. With the mysterious item, Rand and the Ashaman begin to make gateways into Altara, where they will try to stop the Sun Chan. When Rand and his army arrive, they take the Sun Chan by surprise, and after five days of fighting, Rand's plan seems to have worked. The Sun Chan are on the run, and Rand is very close to retaking Ebudar. Some of the Ashaman tell Rand that Saidin feels weird in Ebudar and that some channelers have lost control and they've accidentally killed their own men, but Rand thinks that it's just the taint in Saidin, so he tells them not to worry about it. Then Bashir informs Rand that the Sun Chan have adapted to the battle, so he tells Rand that they should retreat for now and regroup, but Rand wants to decimate the Sun Chan and retake Ebudar once and for all. He takes out his mysterious item, which turns out to be Kalendor, and with its power, Rand summons a rain of lightning that destroys the remaining Sunshine army, but then he loses control, and he also destroys his own army. The Ashaman tries to stop him, but Rand is not listening. 
David Bashir tackles Rand into the ground and he manages to stop him. When Rand realizes what he has done, he orders the retreat and he tells himself that for the first time ever, he has lost. Rand goes to Kyrian to see Min and he finds her reading Herod Fels' books because she hopes to figure out why Fell was killed by going through his work. Rand asks Min about the beyond she had about Katsuin and she reminds him that he needs her because she is going to teach him and the Ashaman something very crucial. Then some maidens of the spear arrive and they start beating Rand up. They tell him that he has disrespected them because they swore to protect him but he continues to go into battle without them. Rand knows that they're right so he apologizes to them and tells them that he won't do it again. Then Rand goes to speak to Katwin and he asks her to be his advisor. At first Katwin says no but after Rand asks her again she agrees but only after Rand agrees to some terms. Katwin then informs him that Kalendor is not safe to use and that in order to use it safely he needs to link with two women with one of them guiding the flows. This makes Rand wonder if that's why he lost control in the battle against the Sun Chan. When he and Min are walking through the palace, his chambers suddenly explode and Rand goes to investigate and he orders an Ashaman to protect Min. Rand comes upon the Shiva and two other Ashaman and when they see him, they try to kill him. Rand fights back but the three rogue Ashaman manage to escape. Rand searches for them but he doesn't find them and when he returns to Min, he finds the Ashaman protecting her acting very strange. Min tells him that he has gone insane and he now has the mind of a child. Rand gives the Ashaman a cup of poison and he dies a painless death. Finally, we have Ewain Alvier. She and the rebel Aes Sedai are marching through the nation of Merindy on their way towards Tarvalin with Gareth Bryn's army. Gareth Bryn informs Egwain that an army of Andorans and Morandians are marching towards them so Egwain orders Bryn to set up a meeting with them because she wants to avoid fighting with them. Before Gareth Bryn leaves, Egwain asks him how much rest his army needs before they lay siege to Tarbalin and Gareth Bryn says that they need one month of rest. After Bryn sets up the meeting, Ewain and the rebel Aes Sedai go to see the Andorans and Morandians and they tell Ewain that they can't let them pass through Andor because the Black Tower is there and they're afraid that a battle between them might occur. Ewain tells them not to worry because they only want to remain in Merindy for one month and then they will leave without having to go through Andor. This makes the Andorans and Morandians relax and afterwards, Ewain goes to speak to Lord Talmanis and he tells Ewain that he and the band of the Red Hand will remain in Mirindi because the King of Mirindi has requested their service. He also tells her that he has been feeling Matt's Taviran effect tugging him so he plans on joining him after he helps the King of Mirindi. Ewain accepts his decision and she returns to the camp. In the camp, the rebel Aes Sedai have a meeting and during it, Ewain asks for a boat to officially declare war on Elida. She says that they need to do this so that the world knows that they're serious when the siege of Tarbalum begins. By the end of the boating, war is officially declared on Elida and it turns out that Ewain only did this to manipulate the rebel Aes Sedai because she knows that when war is declared, the Amarlin Seed has full control over the war so with this new power, she declares that after one month of rest, the siege of Tarbalin will begin. 